I'm Peter Blanc, and this is 2020 TCT virtual, of course. Uh, I'm here for acc.org, and with me uh, are Deepak Bhatt from Boston and Kim Eagle from Michigan. Uh, day two is an exciting day at TCT uh, virtual this year. We have three trials to talk about today, disrupt a coronary lithotripsy trial, a scope two that Dr. Eagle wants to talk about, and then ultimately, ultimate, another trial. So let's begin with you, Deepak, the DISRUPT trial, coronary lithotripsy, something that we've done in the periphery, now turning to the coronary arteries. Interesting, smaller uh, vessels. What do you think about this trial? Well, I think it will be a disruptive technology in interventional cardiology here in the US. Of course, as you mentioned, we've got it for the periphery. In Europe, they've got it for the coronaries, and I think we need it for the coronaries. This was a nice study published simultaneously in Jack that shows that it is safe and effective. Now it's not randomized, but the goal here I think is from an interventionist perspective to prepare a lesion so that you can go ahead and put a drug eluting stent in. And as those of us in the lab know, sometimes when lesions are heavily calcified, very difficult to get full expansion. And if you just throw a stent in there, well, those patients often come back with re stenosis, even in the drug eluting stent era. So the data show that this is safe, it's effective. I suspect it'll get approved in the US and I think it'll replace at least a proportion of coronary uh, rotational and orbital atherectomy. Now, perhaps not in all cases, there were some uh, times where the balloon won't cross and you still need those alternative technologies, but I think it could simplify our life in the cath lab. Yeah, for, for us interventionists, I think it's a step forward. I'm not sure it's a giant step forward, Deepak, because you still have to get a balloon across the lesion. And, uh, you know, uh, rotational atherectomy is still going to have its place as long as there are not a lot, of, a lot of bends and other difficulties that that procedure uh, always carries with it. It's, it's interesting. I think it will be used. It's a fascinating concept and it works in the periphery. Uh, so uh, it'll be a Nice little toy to put up on our shelves for our armamentarium. Kim, let's move on to scope two, something a little bit more in your area of non-invasive um, cardiology. So Peter, uh, scope two is an important study looking at uh, comparing different uh, self-expanding TAVR valves. And of course we need more uh, technology in this space uh, because uh, the, the first core valve has certain sizes and so forth. So this particular trial compared uh, the accurate NEO device to a uh, core valve. Uh, and the, the newer device was available in uh, some smaller sizes down to 23 millimeters. The, the profile of the access catheter was larger. Uh, and so in the group that got the newer, ac the, the, this newer accurate valve, there was a higher incidence of uh, vascular complications. Um, also in that group where there might be a learning curve, the amount of severe aortic valve regurgitation was, was higher in this first uh, 30 days or so. Contrary-wise, the, the need for pacemakers uh, was less uh, in this uh, new group. Um, so I think that uh, clearly as we evolve to have more availability of technology in TAVR and then the mitral space, uh, we need more sizes, obviously a lower profile catheter, less bleeding, but we're seeing advances in technology and that's wonderful for our patients. I really like the head-to-head -head trials as well where they're comparing one device against another. And gotta credit the investigators. It's not always easy to do because sometimes you're comparing a second or third generation commercially available device with a first iteration of a new device. But I think ultimately that does move the field forward. So I, I hope to see more of these head-to-head -head trials. I agree with you, Deepak, and I, I think that um, Clearly, if, if you're dealing with a brand new valve and brand new uh, access catheters, uh, to have the company go ahead and say, we'll, we'll compare it to a more mature technology, we'll take that on. I admire that approach a great deal. Yeah, likewise, credit to the sponsor here as well. You know, similar to what we saw with the Portico valve, where we went head to head and sure, you know, there's some more vascular complications and a learning curve, but it was comparing the first iteration device against second and third generation devices. So I think as long as people, both physicians and regulators looking at the data acknowledge that, look, it's a little bit unfair comparing a first generation device yeah. against more advanced generation devices, the incremental knowledge we gain from these head-to-head -head trials is still worth it. So uh, Kim, if you've got a little gold star around, 
would you put that on your forehead because you've just become an honorary interventional cardiologist? That's <laughs> awesome. Peter, you, you tried to teach me interventional cardiology, and after a few months, you uh, said it's not possible. <laughs> okay, let's move on. The ultimate trial is the third trial today that we really need to discuss. Uh, I'm going to go back to Deepak for ultimate. Yeah, I, I think this is the ultimate in intervention where it shows that using intravascular imaging can enhance the outcomes in the cath lab. And, and this is consistent with really a growing body of data that supports that angiography alone or angiography alone it is insufficient to optimize stent deployment. And using technology such as intravascular ultrasound, as was assessed in this randomized trial, uh, can produce better outcomes. So. You know, there's some added cost and time, of course, if you're using IVIS or OCT, which wasn't studied here, but it has been studied and is being studied in other trials. But I think uh, putting those issues of logistics and cost aside, uh, probably it does help improve patient outcomes, as this study did show. And this is a three-year outcome. Earlier data had been presented from Ultimate previously, and it shows that even at three years, there's a separation of the curve. So, you know, probably something to this concept of doing the imaging and optimizing the stent deployment. So uh, let me just ask you a question uh, or make you a bet. I will bet you you don't use ultrasound for every one of your stents. Would this make you say maybe we ought to ultrasound everybody? It seems to me, yes, there are differences in the outcomes of three years, but the difference aren't, are even though statistically significant, they're not huge. Right. Uh, what's your thought on that, Deepak? I mean, clearly it's going to be more expensive. It will take more time. Uh, the techs in the cath lab will roll their eyes and say, oh, my God, not again. Uh, what are your thoughts? All valid points. Uh, you know, there's definitely cost issues. There's definitely time and logistics issues. And the incremental gain might be modest. And, you know, there's, of course, the counter argument that if you just use higher magnification and you know, uh, sort of uh, orthogonal views, you can typically get to the same place. But uh, putting that uh, aside, I, I do think there's something to it. And I think there's also oftentimes in interventional cardiology, you know, a herd mentality. And, and there is a bit of that going on with imaging. And I think imaging is just catching on. So I think in a few years, it's just going to be built into our cath labs. It'll be part of our workflow. The nurses and techs will be very familiar with the technology. And I predict IFR, IVIS OCT will be so integrated into our consoles even there, uh, right at the cath lab table that it will be part of our practice. You know, at the Brigham, for example, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think we're up to about 60, 70% of our uh, cases uh, of stenting where we're using imaging now, either IVIS or OCT. If you throw an IFR, it's an even greater percentage. So I, I think this trend will grow both nationally and internationally. Peter, I think that there, there, there is a trade-off, of course, right? There's more lab time, there's more dye. So as Deepak says, we're going to want to individualize how we approach each patient, each set of circumstances. And if there's borderline renal function and it's a straightforward lesion, I'm not sure we want to spend extra time doing the imaging if we think we can get a nice result without the extra time and or dye. There you go. The world, the word of reason from Pim Eagle is always. So he uh, could have been thank you, folks. Uh, that's the end of day two. Three interesting trials. Appreciate your input on these. <laughs>